So why don't we open it up now to some questions from the floor. If anyone has questions for Mikhail or Marion, to so show your hand. I was wondering what you feel about the example of Solzhenitsyn, who was, of course, he was in exile in the United States for some years. Um, I thought he was very courageous, but he was also, uh, he didn't mind criticizing the United States while he was here. He had some very, maybe maybe they were true, some of his criticisms. I don't necessarily disagree with him, but I was just wondering what Solzhenitsyn in that sense meant to you. What does Solzhenitsyn mean, mean to me? As an exile and as, as what he was doing, writing and, you know, his criticisms of the Soviet Union. No. As a writer, I think he is a great writer, but uh, actually not... <laughs> uh, he, he didn't realize that he made something new in Russian literature, not writing his uh, fictional books, but uh, by writing his Archipelag Gulag. It's, I, I think it's a new type of the, of the novel, it's absolutely fantastic. For me, uh, I was a young boy, yeah? and uh, reading was something special for me because you see you were born in the happiest country of the world and suddenly you you realize it's not the happiest but it's the prison mm -hmm. you are born in prison yeah? and you are slave and your body belongs to the state and you belong to the state they can do with you everything they want, they could send you to the war and so on. And the only territory of freedom, of my freedom, is my head here. And my struggle is reading, because the whole situation of lies is humiliating for me. The only situation where I'm not humiliated is reading. Yeah, reading. And uh, reading Solzhenitsyn, reading Archipelag Gulag, it was my, my struggle against the regime at that time. And so I'm absolutely helpful, uh, thankful <laughs> to, to Solzhenitsyn that his books helped me to survive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, his situation was very, very difficult because, you see, it was the war, actually, the, the Cold War and the Civil War. And he was in the situation of the Civil War against the Kremlin, and so the enemy of our enemy is our friend. And so he went to America, but it, it couldn't be his friend actually, yeah? It was another enemy. <laughs> so he, he, it, it, it was a difficult hum, human situation, but I think he was absolutely important person for Russian history. He made another example how a book could be a weapon, yeah. He, he, his book just ruined the communism, yeah. And the information is also nowadays the only weapon of the uh, opposition in Russia. Nobody wants revolution. We have very bad uh, experience yeah, in the 20th century. Nobody wants. It. Now we have actually a very interesting situation in Russia. We have actually. No, it was before the revolution to uh, 1917, the same situation. We have two nations calling themselves Russians, speaking Russian, yeah, sharing the same territory. But mentally, they're absolutely different. The smaller part, yeah, they live in big cities, they have higher education, they have seen the world, yeah, they have earned some money, they are civil society, they are third class, they are prepared to, to live but in democracy. Yeah, they have liberal ideas. And we have the other nation, yeah, simple people, they have no internet access, no money, they live in the province, and they go only have the information from the state television. And the only way is just to bring much more information to this second Russia. And this is the only way to win. So, and again, the, just the word is very important in Russia. And without the free word and the internet, 
uh, these all protests would be impossible last year, absolutely. And we have now a very interesting situation. So the, we have the dictatorship of the 21st century. It's not it's possible to compare to the Soviet Union because we have now free borders. Everybody who is, uh, is free to leave. Yeah? And all uh, intellectuals, all opposition people, yeah, they are in ghetto, in internet ghetto now. So the government in the, in the Middle Ages, yeah, the, uh, they, for Jews, they could have their own God, but only in the ghetto. Yeah? In the ghetto, they are allowed to do everything, but not in the city, not in the town. The same thing is now in Russia. We have the freedom in internet ghetto for one part of Russia, for one nation, for the smaller one, and it's impossible to say anything in the, on television. We have absolutely strong censorship. It's impossible, yeah? And the only way to win is just through the word, through the information. And actually, I'm optimistic. I'm absolutely optimistical. Because you see, the first attempt to introduce the democracy in Russia, 1917, failed because of the World War. The second attempt in the uh, uh, early 90s failed because we didn't have the third class. And now the third attempt, I think, uh, could have better chance. Yeah. Other, other. Uh, how do you account for the fact that even before the internet, the Russian people <clears throat> seemed capable of creating huge public demonstrations, even though they live in what you consider to be a less free place, but yet here in America we seem incapable of the same kind of public, huge, overwhelming public demonstration. Are you sure? Yeah. I mean, I, I see these numbers that come out. I, I was there during uh, several times uh, during politically, you know, just the recent thing over the adoption, let's say. Uh, huge numbers of people coming into the streets uh, to demonstrate, and we just don't seem to do that anymore here. Mm. Oh, well, <laughs> it's about America or it's about Russia, the question yeah. is. It's about, well, it's about, it's just a question. <laughs> I'm sure if Americans will get some problem, millions will go on the streets, really. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Here you have the civil society. Yeah. In Russia, civil society is just like 100 years ago, just a child, just a child. And you can't compare the civil society in the United States and in, in Russia. In, uh, in Russia, I hope, I hope, we will get it, yeah? You see, 150 years ago, Gogol compared Russia in his uh, dead souls with Ptitsa Troika, yeah? How to say it? The uh, troika is the, is the three-horse sled carriage. Troika, and this Ptitsa Troika is... A bird troika. Bird, yeah, like, like, like Russia, like a bird, yeah, which is uh, flying uh, into the future. Yeah? And all uh, Russian generations uh, read this at school, actually, and had to learn it by heart, yeah, these words. And it was so inspiring. But Gogol didn't know, didn't have this uh, experience, this historical experience which we have. He didn't know that this Ptitsa Troika was flying into the catastrophe of the 20th century. And now with our experience, he would compare Russia with the train in the tunnel which can go just from point A to point B and back from 
dictatorship or order to democracy or chaos, which are in Russia actually historical synonyms. Yeah? <laughs> and our generation was on this train leaving from order or dictatorship from Soviet time yeah, to the chaos or democracy of the beginning of 90s. Then this train went back to the order uh, of Putin's empire. And now the train is going back again in uh, the direction of democracy. And people in Russia are very afraid of the new chaos and what uh, the state television yeah, misuses. Yeah, we have Putin or we have chaos of, dem of mm -hmm. the new democracy. Yeah. I've, uh, and, I've, I've just been told that we're just about out of time, so we're going to have to wrap everything up. But if you have more questions, I'm sure that Mikhail and Mary will be happy to oblige. We also have books for sale on the back table. We have copies of Maidenhair. We also have copies of Hi, This is Conchita, the center's first book book, as opposed to uh, an anthology of world literature. So be sure to have a look over there. And thanks to you all for coming out. Let's get a, one more hand of applause.